What up, nerds? Good to see you again. Let's talk about filters. Hey everybody, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me again for another edition of Nate in the Wild Gets Nerdy for Cameras. Today we're going to talk about filters. No, not like that. Not those weird Instagram filters. I mean, literal filters. Like these. Actual filters. These surprisingly expensive little pieces of glass that go on the front end of your lenses and actually do make photos significantly better without a whole lot of extra work. So I'm gonna to put together a little bit of a guide here today to help everybody navigate these confusing waters. I'm gonna have timestamps in the description here so you can navigate through this video to exactly the kind of filter you have questions about, and hopefully that'll help expedite everything throughout this. I put this on my Instagram too, asking everybody to send me their questions about filters so I could be sure to cover all the bases. I got some really great questions, some kind of weird spammy questions, and a shocking amount of Polish responses. Not really sure what that's about, but I'm gonna put these on the screen as we go through the video, and I'm gonna to touch on certain bits and pieces. And any questions that I haven't answered throughout the course of the video, I'm gonna do a little bit of a Q&A at the end to touch on some finer details of some of the more intricate questions. So right off the bat, the question I probably got most was about my personal favorite brand of polarizers. And I will say that I use Breakthrough Photography's filters. They don't sponsor me, they did not pay me to say that. I've used probably five different brands. I just find those to truly be the most color neutral and the cleanest glass with the highest light transmission of any that I've tried. Uh, I'm not even trying other filters anymore. I'm that happy with them. They're not cheap uh, for their top level glass, but they are pretty amazing. I'll put links to those down in the description as well, so you can check those out. And full disclosure, those are affiliate links. I would appreciate if you're gonna make a purchase, click through from those because it just helps me keep this channel going and supports me on my journey. So to start off, here are the different categories of filter we're gonna discuss along with a timestamp of where they'll appear in the video. We're gonna start off with a circular polarizer, commonly referred to as a CPL. We're gonna move on to NDs, of which there are several different smaller subcategories. I'm gonna talk about a night sky filter, which is kind of exciting. And then finally, UV filters. So a CPL or a circular polarizer is commonly referred to as a photographer's best friend. And that's because it is probably the single most useful lens for everyday landscape, wildlife, portrait style photography. And that's because it does one very specific thing. It filters out polarized light. Pretty easy to guess from the name, right? But what exactly does that mean? When light is emitted from the sun, it's a wave traveling in all directions, vertically, horizontally, and every angle in between. Normally, all light is created equal, but when it bounces off reflective surfaces, such as clouds, atmospheric haze, or water, that omnidirectional wave is collapsed into a directional wave. In other words, it becomes polarized. A polarizing filter does exactly what it sounds like. It filters out polarized light, rendering haze nearly invisible. So to demonstrate this point, I took some video at the Grand Canyon on a recent trip. You can see that it's kind of boring middle of the day lighting, but as I rotate this circular polarizer, the haze seems to just simply disappear with almost no change in the exposure or the color temperature of this video, which is a pretty dang cool thing to be able to do if you ask me. This is a great way to give a little more contrast to your sky. It brings the blues out. If you're looking at a very expansive vista and the lighting conditions aren't right, a polarizer is a great way to try and eliminate a little bit of that and bring more contrast back to your scene. A lot of people ask me if there's a way to skip filters and do some of this in, in post-processing, and the answer is sort of yes, but also sort of no. It's very difficult to replicate a polarizer. It's absolutely one of the filters that I cannot recommend enough. Uh, I would say it's almost a must-have for every photographer. Now, ND filters at first glance seem like probably the most overwhelming subset of filters, and that's just because there's several different kinds. Variable ND, graduated ND, and then 3-stop, 6-stop, 10-stop, 15-stop ND. But they all do more or less the same thing. So ND just stands for neutral density, and that just means that it darkens the image uniformly. The neutral density means it's not going to shift your color or do anything crazy like a polarizer. It just neutrally darkens your photo across the frame. And you want to do that in order to control your shutter speed. So for example, if you want to take a photo of a flowing river that looks soft and has motion blur, but it's the middle of the day, a neutral density filter will help you darken the image enough to do a longer shutter speed. Now three stop, six stop, 10 stop, 15 stop, etc. 
that just means the amount of darkening in terms of stops. So as you know, your aperture, your f-stops, are all related to the amount of light coming in. Same thing applies for a neutral density filter. 3-stop, 6-stop, 10-stop, 15-stop are all just measures of how dark it's going to make your photo. Now, which one you use kind of depends on the situation, and there's no possible way for me to give you a one-size-fits-all guide here. But as an example, I went out yesterday and I found this little creek to take some sample photos. So you can see in the first shot that my shutter speed was pretty high. There's no motion whatsoever. Everything's pretty sharp and crisp across the frame. Now, I stopped all the way down with no filter to f22 to see how slow I can get my shutter speed. And you can see that the water is a little bit softer looking, but of course you don't ever want to take a photo at f22. That's just kind of bad technique. So I put on my six stop neutral density filter from Breakthrough and you can see now we're kind of getting somewhere. I'm at f9 here and I was able to do a long enough shutter speed to really get that water moving, get some gentle motion to it. But I put on my 10 stop, I lengthened up to a 15 second exposure and now we're actually looking at a photo that starts to look a little bit artistic. I did very little of this editing wise there's nothing really fancy going on in terms of my exposure or anything. It's just the fact that it was a 15 second exposure makes the water look soft. It's kind of a fun trick to add a little pizzazz to any photo. Now, I put on the six stop and the 10 stop to be as close to a 15 stop as I could get with what I had on hand. And you can see now a 30 second exposure. There's a pretty significant difference. It's a really smooth, nice, silky looking frame. And at this one, I was able to go up to f2.8 because I had such an intense ND system on the front of my camera. Now I have a little bit of a depth of field blur and a motion blur, and it's kind of an artistic frame for very little effort. So the ND filters I was just demonstrating are your standard neutral density filters. They're just a single piece of glass, three stops, six stops, or 10 stops of darkness, exposure value, reducing glass, and you choose which one you want to put on your camera based on your goals for the scene, depending on how bright it is and then how much you want to darken it for your shutter speed, etc. Now, for people who don't want to carry three or four different varieties of glass and filters in their camera bag, there's such a thing as a variable ND filter. These work much the same way that a circular polarizer does, in that you have two opposing pieces of glass that rotate around each other, and this will darken your scene between one stop and ten stops, depending on how far you rotate it. The benefit of this is that you only carry one piece of glass, and they're often considerably cheaper than a full neutral density system made out of three or four individual filters but the trade-off is that they tend to be slightly lower quality optics, and that's just because of the way that they're manufactured, having two opposingly polarized pieces of glass that uh, gradually darken the scene depending on how much you rotate them. There's just no great way to do that and maintain professional quality optics all the way through that filter range. There's a couple companies that have tried. I haven't uh, been overly impressed by most of the offerings, and in general, most professional companies are not offering a professional level variable ND filter. And that brings me to another thought. A question I got a lot is, is there really a difference between a $30 and a $100 filter? And the answer is absolutely yes. When I first got started in photography, I bought a little you know, $25 variable ND filter for my tiny little pancake lens. And it was great because I learned what an ND filter was and I got to experiment with it and I found out that I didn't like it and that was great and it's a good learning experience. Uh, to be honest, now my filters are probably $150 to $200 each and I have three or four of them and I, I know that's a huge expense for a lot of people in photography and it's tough to justify if you're not a working professional in the industry. But I do want to put this thought in your mind. If you buy a $3,000 full frame camera body and you put a $1,500 full frame, beautiful prime lens on the front, and then you take a $25 filter that might be glass, might be plastic, are you really doing your best to get your best image quality? The, the way I see it is the light passes through your filter first. Everything else that your lens and your camera do after that is dictated by the quality of that filter. And putting a cheap filter on an expensive professional camera is basically just you're putting the weakest link first. I wanna have a professional quality filter on the very front. It's $200, which kinda sucks, 
but uh, if my light is going through a $200 professional caliber filter, then I know that the $4,000 assembly behind it is able to perform at its highest ability. Another really common style of neutral density filter is called the graduated ND. And I think a lot of people get a variable ND and a graduated ND confused, but they're actually quite different. So the variable ND, of course, varies between one and 10 stops. Whereas a graduated ND is a rectangular plate of glass where only the top half will be darkened and the bottom half won't. And this is used for super dynamic landscape scenes primarily where you're shooting, let's say, a sunrise with the sun coming up. So your foreground is in the shade and it's dark, but the sky is blazing with the fresh light of a brand new day. So you'll take one of these graduated ND filters using a, an attachment system on the front of your lens and you can actually place that graduated line right on the horizon and only darken the sky. Some people call these uh, a Lee style filter system. That's the brand name for them, but every company actually will make a variety of graduated ND filters. And they are kind of fun because they come in varying darknesses, two, three stops, and in varying degrees of graduation. So you can have one with a hard line for a, if you're shooting in the plains of say Nebraska or Kansas, and some with a little bit of a, a graduated line if you're in a more mountainous terrain and you want to soften that edge a little bit. Uh, they're pretty cool. They're a very specific use case. I don't find them to be quite as versatile, but when you need one and you have one, it is just a thing of beauty. Now, perhaps one of the most exotic filters, and it's kind of a newcomer to the scene, is the night sky filter. I'm gonna do a separate video specifically about night sky filters because they're pretty complicated, but the general concept behind them is fairly straightforward. So the visible light off put by cities, that kind of a yellow sodium street lamp that you're familiar with, is between 570 and 610 nanometers. Now, the good news about that being such a narrow wavelength spectrum is that it's very easy to specifically specifically filter that out. Did a couple comparison shots here and you can see this first one was taken in Valley of the Gods in southeastern Utah. It's about as middle of nowhere as you can possibly get. So you'll see going from the non-filtered photo to the photo taken with the night sky filter, there's a little bit of a difference. Some of that yellow glow is gone, but it's nothing incredibly dramatic uh, and maybe not even worth the effort. Now up in Flagstaff, a little bit closer to a, a major city here in Arizona, you can see pretty significant yellow glow on the horizon and putting on my night sky filter did an ex exceptional job. Now the last filter I wanted to talk about is a UV filter. And UV filters are a little bit of a relic from the film days when the glass in the lenses was a little bit simpler and the film itself could actually react with UV light and give you di discoloration and improper exposures. Nowadays, with digital cameras, it's not really much of an issue because the UV light is filtered out at the sensor itself, and the lenses themselves have higher quality glass in them that does a little bit of UV filtering as well. So nowadays, if you hear somebody say that they're using a UV filter, unless they're holding a 45-year-old Pentax film camera, they're probably just meaning that it's a clear filter that goes on the front of your lens, and all it really is for is just a little bit of added protection. So that pretty much covers all of the different filter types types and a little bit of an overview of what they actually will do for you. I want to go through some of these uh, questions that I got on my Instagram and try and fill in any gaps that I might have missed. So the first one is how to filter out the negative people from your pictures. And I think the easiest way to do that is to actually just filter out the negative people from your life. Stay positive, live a positive life. It's too short to be hanging out with those dumpsters. Okay, free water. Good friend of mine, Frankie Spontelli says, the he asks about the go-to filter for daytime dad light. So for those of you who don't know, uh, dad blue o'clock is about 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's when the sun's straight overhead. It's when you go to like Yellowstone and you see a bunch of those dads wearing cargo shorts and socks and sandals standing there with their $10,000 cameras taking photos in the middle of the day. It's very difficult light to make a good looking image. And so I would say the circular polarizer. It'll remove a little bit of that haze and it'll help soften up the image a little bit, but realistically, you should just wait until golden hour. So Scout the Dog asks, when to use EV compensation versus an ND filter? So first of all, good dog. All dogs are good, but Scout learned how to type, and I think that earns at least a 14 out of 10. Now, as I discussed earlier, an ND filter is not to make the image darker. That's when you'd want to use EV compensation. Uh, your exposure value is what EV stands for. You'd want to use exposure compensation if you just want to make your image darker. An ND filter is not for darkening the image. It's for elongating your shutter speed, for adding motion blur, etc. 
what type of filter cannot be replicated with editing and is so actually worth the expense of purchasing? This is a really good question. I would actually say none of them, uh, except maybe like a UV filter, but truly an ND filter you need to own if you wanna do long exposures during the day. And same with a polarizer. There's no way to edit the haze out after you've taken the photo. Okay, I think that's just about enough filter talk from me. If there's any questions I didn't answer during that Q&A session at the end or during the rest of the video, please leave a comment down below. I'll do my best to answer those and I'll probably do a follow-up video for this in the future to touch on any future questions that people might have that I didn't answer in this video. In the meantime, please click like, comment, subscribe, tell all your friends, and send a messenger hawk to your friends in the Earth Kingdom. I'm Nate in the Wild. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.